Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. In Greek mythology, Minos was born to Zeus and Europa. He became the first king of Crete, the largest of the Greek islands, where he didn't exactly rule with kindness. Every nine years, he would demand another ruler to send seven boys and seven girls into the labyrinth. The labyrinth was a kind of maze created for Minos by the craftsman Daedalus, and within its elusive center lived the king's son, the Minotaur, a creature possessing the body of a man and the head of a bull. King Minos, his labyrinth, and his minotaur were all just stories, fables about gods and goddesses to help explain how Greece had come to be. However, to the ancient Greeks, they were more than just stories. They were legendary tales of good and evil about deities that were worshipped by the masses. And if you look at the ruins and remnants left behind by the early Greeks, you start to wonder if they ever really were stories at all. When English archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans found the Palace of Knossos, he called upon his knowledge of Greek myths to aid in his search. He named the ancient people who once lived there Minoans, after King Minos, and then worked for several years excavating a large palace at the site. By 1905, the work had been completed, and through it, Sir Arthur had learned much about the people who once lived in what he called the Palace of Minos. But it wouldn't be until several years later, in 1908, when an Italian archaeologist by the name of Luigi Pernier would find a new piece of a very perplexing puzzle. Luigi had been digging around in the basement of one of the buildings set off from the main palace when he found a small disc. Only six inches in diameter, the circular object featured over 200 impressions of hieroglyphs arranged clockwise in a spiral pattern. He called it the Phaistos disc. As with many archaeological discoveries concerning ancient cultures, the first inclination was to write the Phaistos disc off as a fake, Many historical objects had been revealed as forgeries or hoaxes, and there was no reason not to think the same about this one. But surprisingly, most scholars agreed it was legitimate. One reason for that was the later discovery of an axe nearby, bearing similar glyphs as the disc. The 242 impressions, or tokens, were comprised of 45 numbered symbols, each one unique. These symbols stood for common things like person or child or arrow, Yet despite their clear pictorial intent, every actual decipherment of the disc had been unsuccessful. Amateur archaeologists had tried everything, turning the disc as they read it, proposing possible stories it might have told, but nothing seemed to work. It was thought for decades that the disc might never be translated successfully at all if more symbols couldn't be found elsewhere, either in Crete or in the palace itself, or perhaps from where they originated. Because a scholar back in the 1920s claimed the clay that had been used to form the disc hadn't come from Crete at all, but from somewhere else in the Aegean Sea. There may be more out there, but we don't know where. However, in 2014, two linguists claimed they broke the code. Dr. Gareth Owens, a researcher from Crete, and John Coleman, a professor of phonetics at Oxford University, worked together for six years analyzing what Owens referred to as the first Minoan CD-ROM, Early theories about the disc proposed that it had been a story to entertain readers, a declaration of war, a game of some kind, or even a mathematical equation. But Owens and Coleman figured out the trick to deciphering it. They read it in a spiral direction, working their way from the outside edge to the center, and compared the glyphs to Cretan hieroglyphics, as well as ancient Greek writings. What they came up with were three words, which translated to pregnant mother, shining mother, and goddess. According to Owens and Coleman, the Phaistos disc wasn't a story or a call to arms, but a prayer to a Minoan goddess. It might not be as riveting a conclusion as some had hoped for, but thanks to the work of these two language experts, we now have a greater insight into an unknown religion of an ancient culture. Just don't ask me to try and read the disc. It turns out, it's all Greek to me.
Some people are just born with innate talent. Mozart began composing when he was only five years old. Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician, wrote his first theorem when he was only 11, and British philosopher John Stuart Mill had already learned to speak several dead languages by the time he was eight. Andrew was born in Blooming Grove, New York, and he took a little longer to find his calling. Born in 1826, he had received only five months of formal classroom education by the age of 17. His father had been an alcoholic, and Andrew, along with his mother and sister, had to find work wherever they could to keep a roof over their heads. The young man was a cobbler's apprentice by trade, and found other odd jobs around town so his family could stay afloat. He'd been in Poughkeepsie, New York in 1843 when he attended some lectures on hypnotism from mesmerist J.S. Grimes. At the time, mesmerism was referred to as animal magnetism, and the prevailing theory was that every living thing on Earth was born with the ability to influence other creatures. Some could even use that power to heal. Andrew believed that he possessed special powers, specifically the ability to read minds, He explored these possibilities for the next three years, calling himself the Poughkeepsie Seer, as he practiced his own form of medicine. He used his psychic sight to diagnose sick people and to speak with spirits from beyond the grave. In 1844, Andrew woke up in the Catskills, claiming he'd gone into a trance only hours before where he spoke to Galen, the Greek physician considered to be the father of modern medicine. Though relatively uneducated himself, that didn't stop Andrew from writing books about magnetic healing, many of which dictated to others while in a trance. His first book, Principles of Nature, sold 1,000 copies in the week after its release. One reason for its success, Davis wasn't a scholar. He was a below-average man born with above-average skills, and that made him appealing to the masses. If he could become some kind of mental superhero, then so could anyone else. Unfortunately, while his books were financially successful, they were a critical flop, especially among the intellectual crowd. Critics didn't take his work seriously, often citing factual errors as well as jargon-filled ramblings better suited towards science fiction than credible textbooks. Things weren't looking good for Andrew Jackson Davis. He even had a run-in with the author Edgar Allan Poe, who didn't care much for his brand of shenanigans. Poe wrote a short story just before his death called Melanta Tata that featured a character named Martin Van Buren Mavis, the Tekipsi seer, a nice little dig at the man whose trance sessions had influenced another story of his, the facts in the case of M. Valdemar. Poe had written that one the very same year he and Davis had first met. But Davis and Poe eventually fell out of favor with one another. The Poughkeepsie seer had grown too positive for the Baltimore native, You see, Davis had moved past seances and spiritual contact. He wasn't just a medium anymore. He was a progressive thinker and the founder of a movement, one he coined in his magnum opus, The Great Harmonia. The concept was called the Law of Attraction, and it was much different from the Law of Attraction we know today. To Davis, the spirits he contacted during a seance would only be attracted to his attempts if they shared the characteristics and intentions of the other living people present. Later on, as mesmerism fell out of fashion, the term evolved to be more about earthly prosperity for those with positive attitudes. But Andrew Jackson Davis gave us two more things before his death in 1910 in the form of predictions. In his book Penetralia, published in 1856, Davis wrote, Look out about these days for carriages and traveling saloons on country roads, without horses, without steam, without any visible motive power, moving with greater speed and far more safety than at present. He said these machines would move with the help of a mixture of gas and liquid that ignited safely within their shells. He also mentioned in the same book a type of machine that could automatically transcribe words for him. He called it a soul writer, and he said, and I quote, "...it may be constructed something like a piano, one brace or scale of keys to represent the elementary sounds." so that a person, instead of playing a piece of music, may touch off a sermon or a poem. In other words, the uneducated cobbler from upstate New York didn't just learn how to talk to the dead. He predicted the automobile and the typewriter decades before they were revealed to the rest of the world. Quite the progressive thinker, indeed. 
I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Stay curious.